you very much uh, to Tim there. Um, fantastic demonstration of what Open Layers 3 is capable of right now. The goal of this talk is to actually, now that Eric's provided the justification and the, the framework for, the, um, for Open Layers 3, Tim's showing what it can do. This is going to look in a bit more detail at what's going on actually in the library itself and how we achieve some of these effects. And this is mainly targeted at people who are interested in writing um, fairly advanced applications Open Layers 3. Um, so yeah, we'll peek inside. So, so I'm going to talk about some of the justify some of the design decisions we've, we've made, uh, give you a little view of some of the Open Layers 3 architecture. There's quite a lot there. We only have 20 minutes, so um, there's only a couple of things we're going to look at. And finally, trying to motivate you to have a sort of fast start to give you that initial step to dive into the Open Layers 3 code, either to use it in your applications or uh, to start contributing to the project, or both. Requirements for Open Layers 3, it's a very ambitious project, as Eric um, described. That is, there's a huge amount of stuff that people want. We want to build on all the success um, and the functionality of Open Layers 2, but we also want to bring in new technologies, WebGL, Canvas. We want to support 3D in there. We want to integrate with um, uh, other geospatial applications like Cesium and Open Web Globe. Uh, we want our stuff to be reusable. We want our passes to be reusable. It's just a huge amount there. I mean, it's basically Open Layers 3 just has to be everything to everybody. <coughs> um, that said, it makes for a big, very big library if you do this. And it was one of the criticisms of Open Layers 2 is you end up with a lot of code. Uh, and no, indeed, no one, any individual, is uh, going to use anything more than a small fraction of what Open Layers 3 is capable of. Well, the problem, of course, comes that everybody uses a different fraction. So how do we cope with you? We have these very complex requirements. Uh, but still we need to deliver um, very specific builds for people for their, their individual applications. So what are we doing to tackle this, this complexity of the problem? We're trying to decompose the elements of the geospatial uh, library into core components that can be uh, well separated and can be composed together to build the applications that you need. And we'll look at concrete examples of this, like the difference between uh, sources and layers. All of these have, have well-defined responsibilities, so you can mix and match them and put them together in interesting ways, and we'll see that, um, a couple of nice examples of that. Unidirectional uh, dependencies. This means we try to make a layered approach so that each layer is built on the layer before there are no um, dependencies between layers. Generic internal representations. That's what allows us to provide all this functionality um, across so many different backends. And and then on the actual, that's our design approach. And then behind this, we're using the best available JavaScript tooling that we can get our hands on. The tooling that is um, the Closure Compiler. It's a product from um, an open source project from Google. I'm sure many of you know, at least know about it. Um, it does, I'll explain why we use that in a sec. We have a linter, we're running in absolute strict mode. We have automated te uh, automatic tests running in PhantomJS. We do full integration testing. We have um, uh, behavior driven development with expect.js, uh, and we have continuous in integration. Every pull request um, has to pass the, the, all these integration tests before it can be merged, uh, and this, is, this run all, runs automatically. So we've put in all the tools that we can to help us build a really high quality library. We use them absolutely to the maximum. The Clojure Compiler and, Clo and Clojure Library. This is contentious because Clojure, when you write code for the Clojure Compiler, it's not quite like normal JavaScript. Um, and I want to make it very clear that even though we use it, you don't have to use it in your application. So you will, just the same way as you get a build of Open Layers 2 or a build of Leaflet, which is the one we've minified, you can also just get a build of Open Layers 3 that is uh, minified and specific to your needs. You don't need to, you didn't, if, you're, if you don't want to use the Colorage Compiler, you, you don't have to. That said, there are some good reasons why you might use it. Why do we use it? It has fantastic code minification. Uh, this probably the second best minifier is Uglify.js. Uh, and it's about produces code just half the size of that. That directly translates into faster loading, um, lower bandwidth costs for you. The code produced by the compiler is faster than the normal JavaScript that you write. Uh, there's a couple of reasons for this. One is the compiler can do lots of uh, optimizations on your code and eliminate uh, 
uh, branches which are not taken, functions which are not called, but also the way that the, you write code for the Clojure compiler means that you have to be very strict with your, the types of your objects or your types of your, um, your variables. And this sort of code then runs very, very well on uh, the JavaScript uh, machine uh, engines, V8, uh, SpiderMonkey, and so on that we have. So this directly translates into a real um, speed advantage. And it produces also perfect custom builds. You can build something with an open layers 3 with just the code you need. It is a steep le uh, learning curve with it. You only need to really need to worry about that if you're going to be contributing to OL OL3. Um, a just very brief comment on this, I'm going to move on with the, the stuff. But the, what makes the compo Clojure compiler very interesting is that JavaScript sits in a very strange place where you need to write it for humans. We want nice APIs. We want code that's easy to read, um, nice big comments, well structured, and so on. At the other side, we want code when we deliver it to the, um, to the browser. We want code which the computer likes, which is small, compact, no extra stuff. Um, the Clojure compiler allows us to separate these two, uh, two designs. So we write good JavaScript for people in our application, and the Clojure compiler generates good uh, JavaScript, uh, high-performance JavaScript, uh, to run your application, your user's browser. This is the current size of the library. In raw JavaScript, it's, I've just checked, it's gone over a megabyte, and that's excluding the Clojure library. Um, by the time you strip out the white spaces and comments, you're down to 300k and zipped, this is. Uh, and you can see the full library currently fully zipped is about 90 kilobytes, <coughs> and that's everything in there, all the, all the functionality, all, um, all the different formats, parsers, backends, and so on. With the Clojure compiler, this is the reason why you might want to do it if you're in, you really care about speed and size. If you build your application with OL3, you can get your entire application and open layers 3 together down to about 32K. So it gets really, really small despite having this huge amount of functionality. Um, so now I'm going a bit more into the architecture. Um, Eric's already covered this, so, so Tim's. Um, We'll cover this as well. So there's a couple of um, so I'm going to look at stuff that they haven't talked about in their talk, and give you a couple of examples. So the, ren the rendering we want to have three different backends for it. We want a DOM renderer for all the browsers. We want Canvas, which is very widely supported at the moment, um, has very good performance. And for the future, we want uh, WebGL, which has a lot of interesting ideas, um, the possibilities when it comes to handling large amounts of vector data. And it also is, of course, the only way in which we'll do, be able to do 3D. The, um, at the moment, we have these three renders are implemented. They produce almost pixel-perfect uh, duplications. These three, they obviously look the same. That's the way it should be. But these three maps here, they're all, they've got three different backends. And you see that the, um, only, the only, one, only the one I click on is actually gets the animated <coughs> zoom. But they have... Um, but they're producing the same thing. What this means is that you, as an application developer, user of Open Layers 3, you don't care, have to care about what back end you're using. And you'll just get um, the Open Layers 3 will pick this for you. At the moment, I just put a little bracket there. There are some things that only work in some of the renderers, um, but we're working on that. And the goal is compatibility across the three back ends as far as possible so you don't have to care about it. The render, once the, um, I'll just come out in here. The, the way that you do animations and rendering is very different between these back ends. Um, okay, I'm already at nine minutes, so I'm going to this. What this means is that the way that Open Layers 3 works is actually closer to a, um, uh, a game engine running at 60 frames a second uh, than it is to a classic DOM based uh, JavaScript web app. So if you look under the hood, you'll see some, uh, quite a lot of um, things that look a little, little bit strange there. Um, I'll give you, rather than getting to the points here, I'll give you a quick example of the uh, before render functions, which is how we do our animation. Uh, I will say as well, as now as we're, having, we're trying to run at 60 frames a second to get that smooth animation, that means we have to care a lot about efficiency. This means that we have a few shortcuts in there. We call them view hints that allow us, to, for example, when we're animating uh, to do a zoom, that we don't, keep redrawing for every, every single frame, that we reuse an existing image and stretch it uh, as we zoom in. Animating state is very important for mobile browsers, that we don't just keep turning at 60 frames a second, because that will sit there and use you, m your battery up. So we have a sort of low power of mode that once the view is settled, then it goes, uh, then it doesn't consume any more CPU. 
Uh, we, if you want smooth animation, you have to care about uh, garbage collection in JavaScript. JavaScript's got to stop the world uh, garbage collector. Um, so if you get generate too much garbage, you'll get these garbage collection interruptions, and you'll get frame drops, and it'll look as, as come across as juddery application, uh, jud juddery animation. So all of these things are going in on under the hood. Um, animation. This is. We're doing our animations, uh, uh, we redraw each frame on S. This is an example of a so-called pre-render function which allows us to actually modify what's going to be drawn. Um, so uh, what this, this, this function here is called before we actually draw, it receives the map and a frame state, which is an object which contains a full list of layers, views, everything that we're going to actually draw this, um, in this frame. And we get the opportunity to mod modify it. And I'll give you, uh, we'll, um, so while the animation is running, we've got, we'll have an end time, but uh, we can actually modify, um, particularly with this line here, for example, we can actually modify the resolution at which the map will be drawn uh, before, immediately before the frame is done. And we can calculate that exact, on the exact time. Here we're doing an exact calculation of when we're drawing the frame compared to where we are in animation. So we end up with smooth animation even if we drop, um, we end up dropping frames or, or whatever. Or if we, if we, we don't, even if the um, time is not regular. Um, to show what this looks like, all the, you've seen the demos from, from uh, Tim and Eric. But these, all of these, um, uh, these sort of animations are done with this sort of thing. What's kind of interesting is that um, when you have these multiple animations, is you can compose them. So uh, if I do a spin to roam here, this is both a pan animation, changing from Istanbul to Rome, and the rotation. If we do a fly to burn, we're doing both a pan and a, a zoom out and a zoom in. And you combine, combine them all together, and you get a pan, a zoom out, and a rotation. And that they're all independent, they all independently modify the frame state the way that actually looks, this is the actual code from the example, so it's quite small there, and I can't <coughs> pan down anymore. But basically, we create three different animations, pan, bounce, that's the fly out and the rotate, and then, sorry, it's really small, but this final function, this poor for render says, on our map, do these things. What this means for you is if you want to start providing really interesting, interactive ways of, inter uh, with, of interacting with the map, you want to do cool fly-throughs or follow tours or tell stories by moving... Uh, moving the view around, then that framework is there for you to do this. A difference, this is an example now of decomposition of what's going on. Sources, layers, and renderers. Tim already uh, talked about the um, difference between sources and layers. I want to give you a couple of examples here and justify it in the case, of, uh, give a concrete example in the case of tiles. So sources... Um, the example, we have many different data sources we have to read. However, we've grouped them into three main classes. Tiles, are obvious. Image, which is a single image rather than uh, individual tiles. And vectors, which is, of course, vector data. Separation on top of that is the layer. And we'll look at the details, um, difference between sources and layers in a sec. And then behind that, we have the different renderers, the different rendering backends, and there's a specialism for each type of this sort of class of, of layer. What this means is that as we add more and more data sources here, we add more formats, more different tile providers, and so on, we actually get, um, as long as we fit within these existing classes and these existing layers, so we don't have to do any more work on the renderers. So we can ma increase the amount of data sources we support without increasing the complexity of the rest of the program. Equally, if we want, we could even imagine adding a new renderer, maybe targeting SVG, we can do that at that end, and then we don't have to modify our sources or layers to do that. Um, an example now, um, so here's the differences between sources and layers. So sources basically operate on data, uh, where layers describe how it's presented. Your parameters are source or configure that source. There might be an API key, various parameters, and so on, whereas the layer parameters are more to do with presentation. Sources are, this is, I said, one of the goals is that OpenLayers 3 should be um, usable, uh, the components should be reusable in other projects, and sources are that low-level representation of tiles stored, stored on a, a server somewhere that you can reuse elsewhere. This, um, 
if you're writing, if you just have a single map in your page, then there's, there's probably not so much interest for you. But when we go start integrating with other um, uh, other applications, Cesium, Open Web Globe, the ability to expose our tiles only to them without encumbering them with all our rendering architecture is a very powerful abstraction. Um, it's a principle of tile sources. These things just vary massively. Um, there's a huge amount, I mean, there's a long list there you can read. Some in tile JSON or Bing, you need to make some uh, metadata requests first, or you might want to pass some WMTS capabilities. How the tiles are arranged, where the where the um, coordinate system is, what direction do tile uh, coordinates increase, how do you cope with dateline wraps, all this sort of stuff. It's just a massive amount of variation. What we do in a our open layers three, uh, open layers three uh, tile source just has three properties. It takes all that complexity and it abstracts it behind three properties. We have a tile grid, which tells us how the tiles are laid out. Um, this is interesting properties here. This, uh, this, ex this is one of the examples. The, uh, the black tiles here are actually um, canvas tiles generated in the browser on demand. So they're not loaded from a server. What's kind of interesting here is that, um, I'll zoom out a bit, you'll notice that many of those tile coordinates actually have negative values in them. And the reason is, in OpenLayers 3, one of the simplifications we've made <coughs> is that the origin of tile coordinates is always in the bottom left-hand corner. And when we have something like OpenStreetMap or Google, which starts in the top left corner, we actually use negative numbers. So we can just treat that as a simple, everything starts in the bottom left corner. And that massively simplifies the implementation of the rest of the code. I'll zoom out a little bit further. Actually, we can see it here on this one. Uh, we have multiple, uh, multiple worlds here. We're doing dateline wrap. And you'll see that the tile coordinate of this part of the US here is different from the tile coordinate. So it has the same image tile behind it, but has a different tile coordinate. And this simplification of saying that the tile grid is infinite, starting from the bottom left, uh, makes things a lot easier. The tile URL function, it takes these coordinates and converts them into URLs. Um, that's a way to hook in all your WMTS parameters, that sort of stuff. Um, to observe here that these two US tiles, this one and this one, they have different coordinates but the same image URL behind them. So here we're doing dateline wrap by um, being clever with our tile URL function. The final one, uh, a tile load function. This is an extra hook you can put in to, um, to, uh, to sort of fiddle with the tile or uh, modify the tile loading process. Um, there's an application if you want to store your, your tiles in, in um, uh, PouchDB, for example, or you want to use the file system API, if you want to use open layers as a front end to a application that uses uh, Cordova or Node WebKit, where you have slight different non-URL access to tiles, that tile load function allows you to hook that in. Uh, Fred uh, Juno, a guy at Camp to Camp, did a very nice demo where he uses this tile load function to actually modify the, uh, the tiles here. So these are open street map tiles. Um, Actually, I'll zoom in a bit. Uh, the images are downloaded and then they are transformed uh, using a bit of canvas magic uh, on, on the client. And so this, this abstraction here, these three elements, give us all this power and all this flexibility. Um, of course, for application areas, you don't have to worry about it. We can just, we've provided a whole load of pre-configured sources. You just can, you want a WMTS, you can just provide the URL to your capabilities and off it goes. I'm running out of time, so I'm going to be very quick now. Total change of subjects, um, OL object and OL collection. OL dot collection. This is a um, sort of um, uh, sort of M uh, sort of active object type implementation. It is extremely heavily inspired by MVC object in Google Maps if you use that. Um, and I'll show you this. This view makes many tricky things very easy uh, to implement. What they provide, they provide a consistent uh, interface for events. You'll know what the event is you'll get when a property changes. Um, collections support events when things are added or removed. And what's particularly interesting, I'll show demo of now, is property binding, which allows two different objects to share the same value. So here's an example of using a object. I'll create a map, the first part. We'll get that map's view. 
And then in our document, this is the uh, demonstration that Tim showed earlier, that little slider that moved in sort as he rotated the map. So we'll get that document. We'll wrap it in this little um, bit of ol.dom input magic to get our slider. <coughs> and now this bind to magic here says the value of this slider should be the views rotation. And I'll show you uh, there's a full demo that you can play with here. But this is, here's our map, here's our rotation slider. And as I move the slider, the, uh, the map rotates. And equally, as I move, as I rotate the map, the, the, um, uh, the slider moves. A lot of things in OpenLayers 3 are these magic OL object properties. All your layers are. So we can change the opacity of the, um, of the layer here. Um, on WebGL, we can change colors. Um, toggle visibility and so on. Resolution here is bound to a, a view parameter, uh, the view resolution of the view. So as I zoom in, that changes and zoom out. And in fact, you can take this to fairly extreme examples. In the way that we do this three side-by-side -side example that I showed at the start of the, uh, the presentation is the actual views of these three maps are bound together. Um, so as I move one, the other two move with it because they're showing the same view <coughs> the approach. This starts to get really useful. You can, this makes it very easy to make rich applications that compose many different um, elements together. For example, you've just seen an opacity slider done very easily. Um, here we have multiple views. Uh, if you want side-by-side -side views of different data, you can keep them perfectly in sync by binding the views. If you want a 3D view in, in Cesium or Open Web Globe next to a 2D map in Open Layers 3, by binding the views, you get that, be that behavior um, immediately and very, with very few lines of code. Um, the final demo I'm going to talk about is um, a work done by a guy called Bruno Bino at uh, Camp to Camp. Classically, layers, we have a list of layers and they're drawn. In la Open Layers 3, we actually have a tree of layers. And this, um, this has a number of interesting, interesting components. The, um, particularly, it allows you to group data from multiple sources and combine them and treat them as a single layer. So if you want an application where you have used tiles at a low, at, um, when you're very zoomed out, but then generate WMS images as you zoom in, <coughs> these layer groups allow you to do that and allow you to treat that as a, a single actual layer. Um, so Bruno put together this nice demo here. So I'm so sorry it's so small. Um, this map has, in fact, three layers. And I'll open it all up <coughs> so you can see. So we have three actual layers scanner, of which two are grouped together. And I can operate on those two together. So here, the, the, the colors and the, and the, I can show you the individual layers first. Um, you've got country boundaries. And we have uh, a nice little raster layer. These things here, we group them together. And we can toggle their visibility together. We can uh, toggle their opacity together. Um, I think Hugh should work as well. Yes, and so on. Um, so this, this means that what you can do now is you can compose data from multiple different sources. You can have a raster layer, which has a WFS type vector layer on top of it. And you can treat them as the same thing and put them all, all together. Um, so this, you can see what the, this is all demonstrations of how we've, we've tried to, we've separated things into small components. And then by having these as separate components, you know, there's then lots of rich ways in which you can bind them together to make really rich, interesting, and powerful applications. The next steps, what we're working on right now, is um, we want to get Vector that's working with WebGL. That's our, uh, Camp to Camp's our immediate priority. We've got some performance improvements uh, to do in the way that we um, sometimes we're composing a few too many transparent pixels, but that's going to be um, behind the scenes to anyone. Um, it's not going to affect the API at all. Uh, uh, Boundless Geo doing some great work on vector editing that Tim showed off earlier. And behind the scenes, I mean, this is a big, we have a lot of tools in there. The show we used all the tools turned up to 11. The build system is pretty complicated. We need to simplify it to make it more accessible. In the very long term, um, we want to uh, more flexible composition. This was, uh, I'll go into the details, but we want to make it easier to mix um, 
different data, uh, different renderers behind uh, together. For example, you might have a canvas raster layer with a WebGL vector layer for a number of points, and then a canvas-based vector layer on top of that. Um, or you might put an SVG on. Integration with open uh, with um, uh, with existing open source uh, globes and Flat Earth 3D is 3D but not on the surface of the globe, and that's the that's sort of year and a half or so out. But it's all we're trying to put all the foundations in place so that this functionality can be built on top. That's it for me. These are the, the links. Uh, please do go to O3JS.org and play around. All the examples that I've shown are just standard open layers 3 examples, so you can look at the source code. To get involved, we're on GitHub, and the developer guide on the wiki shows you how to get started. Thank you very much.